Lupton goes for the treble with some freestyle moves. He's calling Munjack and Rowe right up to the rifle. Underwater off Cornwall, Ollie Williams goes spearfishing. Uh, sail corn on the barbecue. Job's good. Burning Britain, wildfires are even hitting marshland. Deborah Hadfield looks at how wildfiring clubs and lowland gamekeepers have to change tactics and create fire breaks. Just going quicker and you could, a human could actually run. Plus, off the peg, Robbie at Clooney Country reckons tailored game guns are more affordable than you think. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. After Roy blanked on our last row rut mm -hmm. outing, well, he will say it was deer management in action, he still has lots of room in his freezer. So to maximise our chances this morning, he's adding muntjac to the ingredients list. Especially as a drop in game shooting on this estate means unusually inactive woods like this one are going to do nothing but nurture the little non-native. Roy's first call brings in a super cautious buck. That was an interesting call. Yeah, no, that was that little bug there came all the way around us through here and circumnavigated all the way around and then made his way up to us here. So he came in from quite a way through. That How wasn't the that buck. Shot? Sorry? How did he take that shot? How did I take that shot? In what way? Did you rest on your arm or something? Yeah, because I couldn't move. I didn't want to move the sticks or anything like that. I didn't want to move my body, so I just brought the rifle around like that and then shot like that. So if I'd, if I'd really spun round, he would have made us. I mean, he was... Well, sticks, there's no way you're going to move your sticks. Or... Well, no way I was going to move my sticks and there's no way I was going to be able to turn on him because he was no, 10 yards. Through the camera, I had no idea that it was that close. Did you not? You know, as I say, he was, he was literally in on 10, 10 yards on a set. I think I just say that rifle is really quiet. It is incredibly quiet, isn't it? The, uh, the Stalin moderators are brilliant on these. It's a, a lovely, lovely little setup on the, the Tika T3 with the Stalin. Um, incredibly lightweight as well. I could just pull that rifle around, just pulled it around like that, rested it on my arm here, um, and was able just to take the shot on him as he was coming in. They are a, a very nice little setup for this sort of terrain. Okay, 13. 13 what? 13 metres. Okay. So that was three metres out on that. And again, perfect little cull animal. So we shall deal with him and see what else we can find. Is this one or is it two, Roy? How do you mean? Scent glands, one on each leg, is it? Yeah, yeah, one on each leg. You know, yeah. Bilateral scent glands. But they rubbed that on a tree or what was it? Yeah, no, so it's just as they're, they're walking through vegetation. So as they're walking through the, the long vegetation, that's just constantly marking, leaving the scent as they go, so marking their territories as they're walking through. Do you recognise this chap? No, no, this is a, a youngster. He's not an overly wide head, but for a young deer, for a yearling, it's still a, a, a relatively good head. He's still got the makings of a, a six-point buck there. Patience once again pays off, as does being confident, shooting freehand. In this instance, Roy had the choice of using the Leica Fortis 6 scope with its wide field of view or switching to the Aimpoint Acro riding on top. You can't have too many toys, tools, I mean. That's that little chap dealt with, so we'll just leave him here hanging in the tree. There's not too much fly activity here, so we should be right for an hour or so. He'll be certainly better off there than he will be in the back of the truck. Now the pressure is off, Roy has a play. We drive, stop, and test sex drive. Oh, come in. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> One of them even finds Roy's truck alluring. I was hoping we could get him a bit closer, but I think 35 yards for bringing him into a, a large Toyota is um, is probably about as good as we're going to get. But, but you know that that is a prime example of what goes on when you know, you've got an animal that is sexually charged. We see prime examples of that every Friday and Saturday night at the pubs. But he was a, a nice little lad. He had a lovely shape on him. He's going to be one just to leave for the future. Having confused some bucks on the open ground, Roy dips back into the slightly shabby woods. He lets this buck go. They had a nice shape. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. They still stay still. So, yeah, come on, come on, Jack, come on, Jack, come on, Jack, come on. Yep. Out of sight of the camera, a Monty mooches across. It wasn't coming in, that was going across. Was it? Yeah. That was perfect time for the 10 minute chat, wasn't it? It was. So. Do you not like my drive? <laughs> that worked out quite well. So hold on, that was a brace of mud drive. Sorry? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> From zero to hero in no time at all, Roy has three on the ground. Got a, a buck in the dough, Munty. It was the buck that I shot first. Um, so he came on and I stopped him because he was just crossing through. I just stopped him with the call. Um, and then the doe just walked out going back that way. And we have got an increasing muntjac population on here, so I think we're going to see a lot more muntjac moving around, especially in a season like this where a lot of estates aren't shooting. So the disturbance is going to be minimal um, in, the, in a lot of the woodland, so it's going to be prime for, for muntjac breeding and, and muntjac um, reproduction. So that was a, a nice little opportunity to take a couple home and fill the freezer. Good. And they do, they do taste divine. With the two little deer cleaned, it marks the end of another row rut and another exceptional delve into the rose world, thanks to the hunter's right. box of tricks. I wonder <laughs> how many non-hunters buy row calls. If you're looking for hunting gear from quiet ticker T3Xs to aimpoint red dot sights to Leica scopes and range finding binos, then head to kitfinder.co.uk where a network of dealers are ready to respond to your kit requests. Link is in the description below. Thank you, Roy, and Kitfinder is producing some interesting statistics on what we're all buying. So to find out what's hot and who's cooking, there's a link to them in the description below. Next up, there's lies, there's damned lies, and there's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The RSPB has called for restrictions on the release of game birds to help stop the spread of avian flu. Basque head of game and gun dogs, Glyn Evans, says the RSPB is making claims without evidence to back it up. He says there's no scientific proof bird flu has spread from pheasants to other wild birds. He says the RSPB's campaign is unacceptable and shows a fundamental lack of understanding of bird flu. Glyn says the work of gamekeepers and shoots helps prevent the spread of the disease. There's a suggestion by the RSPB that birds being released would be released infected. Now this shows a lack of understanding of how game bird management actually happens so game farmers, the birds at a game farm will be under the care of a vet. The vet is there to ensure that they're kept healthy and their welfare is ensured so any any issue would be immediately spotted and, and it's just not going to happen in practice. The National Gamekeepers Organisation has launched a new film revealing how gamekeepers ring Merlin on managed grouse moors. 
The NGO is working with the British Trust for Ornithology on the project. The Merlin, which is the smallest falcon in the UK, is a red-listed species thought to number around a thousand pairs in the UK. The birds thrive on managed moors and successfully breed on them in summer thanks to gamekeepers controlling predators. The Yorkshire Dales Moorland Group and the BTO says the ringing work helps give information about the birds' habits. We should find out hopefully about the population as a whole from doing this and it'll teach us a bit more about migration so if the birds are caught again or if they're found dead then we'll know where they've travelled to. A new study claims that women who don't eat meat are more likely to break their hips when they get older. The University of Leeds carried out the research over 20 years and found vegetarians are more likely to experience fractures than meat eaters. Researchers followed 26,000 women aged between 35 to 69 to assess links between health and diet. The report says some vegetarians may lack enough nutrients for good bone and muscle health. The results suggest that vegetarian diets often have a lower intake of nutrients such as protein and calcium, which are more abundant in meat than plants. Namibia is threatening to leave CITES if the organisation bans the import and export of hunting trophies. It is one of several African countries that are unhappy with CITES, which regulates the international trade in animal parts. Forestry and Tourism Minister Famna Shifeta says that banning trophy exports will have far-reaching consequences on the people, wildlife and economy of his country. He warns that banning imports and exports of trophies and ivory will be a catastrophe for Namibia's conservation sustainability. The minister vows that if CITES ignores his country's plight, then it will leave and trade independently. He is appealing for CITES to stick to the current controls based on internationally agreed rules. Meanwhile, leading lion conservation scientist Amy Dickman has criticised moves to introduce trophy hunting bans in the UK. In an article, the Oxford University professor says that trophy hunting import bans are driven more by misinformation than the weight of scientific evidence. She says they risk increasing threats to wildlife and undermining local rights and livelihoods. Anti-hunting group, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, believes it's solved the problem of elephant overpopulation. It's found an area with an overpopulation of elephants and an area with no elephants, and it's moving a surplus of animals from one to the other. I4 funded the move of 263 elephants from Malawi's Liwonde National Park to Kasungu National Park, which has been stripped bare of wildlife by poachers. I4 paid £2 million to tranquilise the elephants, hoist them and one by one place them on large trucks. The Department for National Parks and Wildlife drove them 200 miles north to their new home, where the poachers were waiting for them. I4 believes it has solved the poaching problem in the park through community engagement and because it has built a 40 kilometre fence along one side of it, paid for in part by US taxpayers. American hunters have handed over thousands of comments opposing a proposed ban on lead ammunition in America. They gave in the completed forms as part of the consultation on the US Fish and Wildlife Service's draft 2023 hunt and fish rule. Shooters dropped off their forms at hunters advocacy action centres. They're concerned about the phasing out of the traditional lead ammunition, which it says is the most cost effective. The new law would ban it on a number of wildlife refuges, which Safari Club International says will harm hunting access. Very concerning that they want to phase it out, particularly without having any sort of science that shows that it has a negative effect on population-wide uh, species. A fox has broken into Edinburgh Zoo and killed its oldest penguin. The 35-year-old northern rockhopper, known as Mrs Wallowitz, was hatched in 1987 and lived to twice its life expectancy. The zoo says it's upgrading security to protect birds in the enclosure from further attacks. The female walrus, which became an attraction in Norway for sitting on and sinking small boats, has been shot. Called Freya in the Norwegian media, the animal became a danger to tourists who ignored warnings to stay away. The fisheries minister feared it might attack sightseers. Now fisheries director Frank Bakker Jensen and his wife Hilda have received death threats. The 600 kilogram animal drew large crowds in Oslo, including onlookers who approached with their children. On one occasion, police had to block off a bathing area after the walrus chased a woman into the water. A fundraising campaign wants money for a statue to remember Freya. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. 
More wildlife madness and French vets who tried to drive a stranded whale downriver to the sea ended up having to put it down en route. The beluga whale got stuck in the River Seine in Paris. Rescuers spent almost six hours lifting the 800 kilogram animal from the water with nets. It was in a refrigerated truck when vets say it became distressed. A British angler has set a new record in Norway. Paul Stevens reeled in a seven foot halibut off the coast. It took 20 minutes to bring it to the boat and he and the boat's crew estimated it at 180 kilograms, making it the biggest halibut caught by a UK angler. Paul is a manager for Sports Quest Holidays, which organizes fly fishing, shooting and sea fishing trips around the world. Link in the description below. He said the halibut pulled the boat half a mile. He returned the fish to the water after catching it. The world record for a rod caught halibut is a quarter bigger and stands at 232 kilograms. They can grow to more than 300 kilograms. And finally, house sales can come with incentives. One estate in America is offering gun dogs and horses to sweeten the deal. The palatial spread in southwest Georgia, built by a Florida property developer, has 1,650 acres, a kennel for 20 dogs and stables for eight horses, all fully stocked for the new owner. The land is good for deer hunting, quail hunting and horseback riding. There's a sporting lodge and a lakefront dock for roasting oysters. The new owner will also get boats, tractors, ATVs and trucks. If you fancy a move, the asking price is just over 12 and a quarter million dollars. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Buying shooting kits? Then head to Kit Finder and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the UK. Kit Finder, the shooting kit comparison website. Later in the show, we're spearfishing in Cornwall. First, we have more podcasts out for you to see, including this one where six members of the Westminster Eight, who burst in on the House of Commons chamber in 2004, reunite at the Cartagena's Game Fair Theatre to tell me how it happened and what the consequences were. Links to that and to other podcasts in the description below. Now, wildfires. Upland gamekeepers are at the front line against moorland wildfires. Now, lowland gamekeepers and wildfowling clubs are having to come up with firebreak strategies, as Deborah Hadfield finds out. Wildfires are deadly for wildlife. They damage underlying soil and even marshland. With record-breaking heatwaves, fire services across the UK reported more than 750 wildfires by August 2022 more than three times the number for the whole of 2021. And just to put into context, wildfires classification, a wildfire has to be bigger than a hectare. So we're not talking about a small grassland fire in somebody's garden, we're talking about a big uh, damaging wildfire. And the Met Office have predicted that wildfires will only increase in the future. And that is also in line with what, the, what governments around the world have basically said regarding wildfire linked to climate change and human activity as well. So it does look like we are going to be seeing more wildfires in the future. Controlled fires work for wildlife. They create fire breaks and allow regeneration of plant life. Gamekeepers who manage the UK's moors and uplands are the firefighters greatest allies. The relationship is very important. It allows us to have somebody who's familiar with the terrain, the access routes, the type of vegetation. Um, by working together, we can obviously be more proactive in dealing with the fires, uh, utilization of their equipment in creating fire breaks such as tractors for the landowners and farmers. Um, and by having that pro proactive relationship, it allows us to deploy more efficiently and also gives us a, a watching brief over the land. So we do have contact numbers and it allows us that direct contact in that response should we need to. The flames and smoke from one lowland wildfire in Norfolk in July 2022 could be seen from miles away. The fire damaged 120 acres here on marshland that's managed by the Heacham Wildfowlers Club. The group, which shoots ducks and geese, has been working to restore the habitat. The flames were too big and the heat and the smoke, we couldn't control it. We was backwards and forwards along the bank looking for the wildlife, trying to rescue it, getting the monk jack out and different birds. Sadly, we lost some, 
we couldn't help that. That's beyond us because the flames and the heat and the smoke was just horrendous. It, it's unbelievable. It was going quicker than you could, a human could actually run. And the heat and the poor, some of the poor animals just couldn't get out of the way. The fire broke out here on the hottest day of the year. Temperatures were above 40 degrees. This marshland is not alone. In August, Norfolk fire crews battled a blaze 30 miles away at Salt House Nature Reserve. As summers get hotter, the risks of more fires is rising. Unless landowners and land managers follow the example set by moorland gamekeepers. The shooting community and the gamekeepers have been leading the way with this stuff. Um, they've been shouting about wildfire for the past 20, 30 years. Um, they've seen this on the horizon, they've known what was coming, um, and they've managed their moorlands to make sure that the wildfire risk on driven grouse moors, or on managed grouse moors if you like, is, is much less of a risk than it is in other areas. So they've been doing, they've been doing some cracking work. If you do not manage vegetation, you are asking for trouble. Not just on your own land holdings, but on your neighbouring land holdings. And for the RSPB to actually call for a ban on all burning, I find quite unbelievable. They are creating a significant risk. And I would go so far as to say that their actions are irresponsible. Heacham Wildfowlers Club leases 250 acres from the 4,000 acre Ken Hill Estate, which also runs Wild Ken Hill, a walked up partridge shoot and nature reserve that's the filming base for BBC Spring Watch. Ken Hill hit the news in 2021 when it pulled out of a project to release white-tailed eagles. Owned by the Buskell family, it prides itself on access to the public. Darren believes the fire may have been started because of a discarded cigarette or bottle. A bit of sun on the glass could do anything. I mean, when, when the fire was burning, me and one of the firemen, we watched an ember go up in the air and hit a bit of grass, and it was just like someone had chucked petrol on the grass, it just whoosh, it went, it was so dry. It's about personal responsibility, and if you're coming to visit, don't bring any materials which could ignite, whether it's smoking materials, having portable barbecues. The blackened earth and charged vegetation are a sombre reminder of the devastation a fire can cause, though there are already green shoots pushing through. It will take around five years for this land to fully recover from the fire. Sad day and people have got to, hopefully the members of the public can um, you know, learn from it, learn from our mistakes, take your rubbish home, no discarded cigarettes and hopefully it'll never happen again. I mean this to me in my mind is going to take five years to get back, to rejuvenate yourself. God forbid we don't want it to get back and that happen again because it's just knock on effects going to take longer and longer for wildlife to come back. Across huge, huge swathes of the country, there is there is a real concern for for the, the regularity of wildfires. We're particularly concerned about wildfires on moorland habitats because the moorlands and the grouse moors are part of some of the biggest carbon store in the country in peatlands. And if you look at one wildfire, um, quite a famous one that you might have heard of in Saddleworth Moor back in two thousand and eighteen. Uh, Saddleworth Moor emitted enough, the same amount of carbon as the annual use of 100,000 family cars and that went up into the air in three weeks. So you can see how much carbon can disappear in a wildfire, not to mention the damage it can have for biodiversity and how, how many years that takes to recover and the damage that it can have for, bio, for, for broader biodiversity as well, so for ground nesting birds and reptiles and insects. Um, it's a hugely devastating thing. The fire has been a tough lesson that all land now needs the same kind of fire prevention work that gamekeepers do on the UK's uplands. In the past, it would be unusual for wildfowling associations to actively manage the conservation on the areas they look after. In the future, the Heacham Wildfowlers Club is determined to do whatever is necessary to prevent such devastation. We might put a fire break in if we can. It's got to be a big fire break because how the flames were and how it went up so quick, well, I think we'll, we'll have a hell of a job, you know, because the, 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 how the environment is down here, it's all overgrown, it's reeds, it's grass, it's all done for nature. The Wildfowling Club has set up a Just Giving page to raise £3,000 to carry out fire prevention and repair work. Thanks to the Heacham Wildfowlers and all who took part in that, now it's time for some underwater deer stalking. 
That's how spearfisher Matt Coombe describes his sport. Ollie Williams joins him off Cornwall to look for bass. Once you get in amongst that, you just want to go really, really slow. Yeah. And just tuck right into it and look through the gaps as much as you can. Yeah. As soon as you start looking through the gaps, you'll either see the tail or you'll see a head and just real slow movement for the gun. Keep the gun pointing where you're looking Stop. all the whole time, yeah, and just keep everything really slow and smooth. And hopefully you should pick so up So what is it, that, what is it that spooks the, is it the movement that spooks yeah, it's the more the movement. To the... They say that eye contact with the bass will spook them. Uh, but I see. Maybe just woo them. Yeah, just look like away from them. <laughs> <laughs> like this. <laughs> nah, that's probably your best bet. Yeah. Why is low tide good? What is, what is that? Well, usually I would have said it's good because the sun's been on it all day and it's super warm and they seem to just lie up maybe to digest what they've eaten. Yeah. Today, chew, not chew so the much. Cod. Yeah. I would say today, not so much with this weather. Chew the cod. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Next time on David. <laughs> Let's uh, get kitted up, shall we? Mm -hmm. I literally, you can see, have all the gear and absolutely no idea at all. So why have... Apart from what Matt's taught me, of course. Um, I would just say it's underwater deer stalking. Slow, steady, you know, trying to pick, you've got to pick the right spot, pick the right fish. It's underwater deer stalking, best way to describe it, I suppose. We're, we're after bass, I think, predominantly today. Um, uh, and the legal limit, which I've been told, is 42 centimetres. So, uh, and obviously I work in inches, as do all men. Um, but no, 42 centimetres. Do you need a CP at Bream here? Yeah, we could get guilt, guilt head Bream, mullet. I, had a, I think Bream's probably one of the best eating fish you can get. There is sea trout here, but we're not allowed to shoot those, they're protected. So no sea trout. Mullet, Henry shot mullet the other day, walked out to the sea and said, look at this bass I've shot. And even I didn't know it wasn't a mullet. It's a fish and um, you know, it was very, very tasty. Uh, we cooked it about an hour later uh, on the barbecue um, and uh, I got the uh, best bit, you know, a nice little um, slither of it. Which is fantastic. Uh, what about flatfish? What are they? Yeah, you get uh, you get flounder. You might get the old place. Yeah. Usually around the edges of the reef, where the reef meets the sand. Oh yeah, and they just sort of yeah sit there. They look at may see the old cuttlefish. There's been a couple caught by the Welsh lads that were down with me last week. Oh cool. They had three on the second reef over from where we are today. Uh, mackerel. If you can shoot a mackerel, yeah. Are they quite difficult? Though? They're pretty fast. You look like a kind of ras, you know. No. I don't want like a ras, they, you don't, you don't, well, Henry's, Henry's the only one that shoots ras, and insists they're edible. We take to the water. We were going to go to nearby Paul Kerris Beach, but in what is becoming tediously normal for Cornwall, there's been a sewage leak, and that annoys Matt. Bear in mind that we just got fined £85 because clay particles might get from our duck pond into the sea by the Environment Agency. But a few months back, Imrus had a humongous clay leak which turned the entire bay white. Um, Have they been prosecuted for that? I've asked and nobody wants to answer that question. I mean, will South West Water get prosecuted for, for the sewage pipe leak? No, of course it Apparently it's all monitored. The Environment Agency apparently there monitoring the water and testing the water daily. I'm there daily and I've not seen... I've seen them there once testing the water and that was Cornwall Council, I believe, not the Environment Agency. They just seem to do what they want at the moment and we're the ones taking the brunt of the the action we've got how much coastline here and half of it we can't use on a good day because it just stinks people are reporting the raw sewage washing up on the beach yesterday including tissue happily we are on currently unpolluted porth peen beach on the other side of carlian bay it's not long before ollie gets the fish he came for a sea bass you can see the jolt of the harpoon going off and finding its mark. You can't see the fish, so you'll have to take Ollie's word for it. Charlie. Hi. Oh, well done. Yep, yeah, shot him. He was above, I was above him. So all I could see was sort of that. Well, I shot him through the top of his, top of his spine there. Um, but yeah, lovely fish. Perfect size. That is a barbecue classic, isn't it? Absolutely chuffed, yeah. Yeah. Bit of silver foil. Get all these scales and then just uh, silver foil on the barbecue. Job's good. The other two have been fishing or stalking the other end of the beach. They come back with fish too. 
so the one I got kind of came um, through kind of like a, a crevasse of rocks, dived down a bit, the two of them came round, kind of came round from my left or right, so I kind of just swerved like that, and just popped the back one. So I uh, got him right basically here. Um, yeah. Don't know if he's in there, he's like, yeah, he's big. So a good one. Yeah, we eating it later. I wrestled with a lobster, we went in a hole and I couldn't get him out. It's funny, it was literally like, if I'd, I had a chance to sort of, I was distracting him with a spear, yeah. I had a chance to like grab him then, and then obviously I, I think it was so deep, and I ran out of breath, and I tried to go back and find him, but I just, he's gone, he's gone. And then once they're gone, they're gone. They're gone. Now, weird thing, when you're dealing with um, meat, red yeah. meat, we keep that well away from water, don't we? Yes, we do. But this is a fish. This is a fish, and it comes in the water, and you know, recycling and all that. You're giving back to the fishing community, aren't exactly. You, you watch that won't. I mean, if we could, could put a GoPro on that, you'd find that it'd be surrounded by all sorts. Of and he's right. Off go the guts. If you want to eat the slightly better bits, and you are in Cornwall in the middle of September 2022, Matt and his gang are organising a spearfishing fest near the town of Par, with cooking, camping, music, and kai at Bryn. For more about it, join Matt's group, UK Spearfishing Buddies, on Facebook. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, all who took part in that. We are still offering a £200 Fox Caller as the prize on Field Sports Extra, the Tuesday night show for members of the Field Sports Nation. Find out how to join them and watch it by clicking on the link in the description below. Just £5 a month. Talking of kit, it's our Field Tester Friday film this week. You're looking for something that's unique. Is that, is that within people's price range, do you think? Definitely, definitely. Chapuis arms do exactly that in over and under or side by side. You have everything from, I mean, I think they start at roughly two and a half thousand up to six and a half, seven, but you've got a completely customizable game gun. Everything from, I mean, at the, at the entry level things, there's, there's small tweaks you can do with auto safe or not auto safe. Um, obviously you can choose the barrel length, things like single trigger, double trigger. And then you go up the range a little bit to their artisan range. I mean, look at that. That is a beautiful, beautiful gun. We've actually got the shot of it being selected and it looks a little bit different, doesn't it? Yeah, so the, the shot you'll see there has got obviously the choices that we sent the customer and they are unfinished, but here you have obviously completely oil finished and the finished product, which just I guess gives it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more zing, shall we say. Chapuis is a, is a company you've been dealing with for a long time though, this is, yes. this is not something, because Beretta have bought them haven't they? Yes that's right and then so therefore GMK is the sole distributor in the UK, a company we deal a lot with anyway and then something like that which is a high grade gun versus like a double E double L, which don't get me wrong are beautiful guns as well, it's something a bit different where you're getting really high quality, but you're getting to make these small tweaks that you might not get to make with other brands. Uh, you get a stunning gun, but it is kind of, unless we have a few in stocks we have, you go, it's that or that. Uh, the Blazer F-16s, when they do it as just a, a game gun, is a wood grade two to, two to 10. Now, it's all very welcoming and going, oh, I fancy one of those and taking off the shelf, but you're gonna to have to wait a little time if you want to, to make one of these, I suppose. Yes, yes, um, as, as you'd expect, I think it's, Roughly three to six months. Obviously, there's a bit of back and forth with them. I mean, good things take a bit of time to make. It's, it's, <laughs> good it's, things it's, those who wait. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's the price you pay. And then you'll have a gun forever that you love and uh, shoot very well with, probably. Thanks, Robbie. Now to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Martinson. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the top hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First, with the grouse season underway, here's a look back at how the BBC reported the glorious 12th half a century ago. Alan Wicker joins a shooting party on a North Yorkshire moor in 1968. How times have changed. In complete contrast, here's Team Williamson competing in the recent Coat of Iron Practical Shotgun Competition at North Cape Butts near Grimsby. Vermin Control Scotland takes a break from his usual rats and pigeons. He's been in Miami hunting with YouTubers the Iguana Man and Iguana Ninja. They compare kit and hunting methods and make a good bag of the invasive pests while they're at it. Ovini Expeditions is in the mountains of Nepal hunting blue sheep, which it turns out aren't blue and are more closely related to goats than sheep. 
Over to Denmark, where Meta Karen Peterson is on a mission to educate the hunting world about lead-free ammunition. She proves their point by taking a nice roebuck with Norma's Eco Strike in 308 caliber. Meanwhile, this unpronounceable Russian channel is out at the opening of the duck season. He has to strip off and fetch a duck that the dog won't retrieve. In Alaska, three first-time caribou hunters have eight days to fill their three tags, shooting the 338 Weatherby RPM. And finally, here's the latest from the National Small Ball Rifle Association, with Elis Martin Buttery explaining why tutu ammo is like ice cream. You'll have to watch it to find out how that works. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at philsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain, it's at 7 p.m. UK time every week. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.